Thanks for watching today at wildwoodchurch.com. Now here's today's message. Merry Christmas. Uh, turn in your Bibles to Galatians chapter 4, 4 and 5. Uh, well, my name is Matt Winquist. I am one of the elders here at Wildwood and uh, the discipleship pastor on staff here at Wildwood. Glad you're here. Um, we're continuing. This is uh, the, the last uh, sermon in the series, uh, our Advent series. And um, do you hear what I hear? Right? That's, that's what we're talking about here. And so we get to pick our favorite Christmas passage. Uh, I want to color a little bit outside the lines. It's actually not my favorite Christmas passage, but it has everything to do with Christmas. Um, I actually, much of the material that is, is in the sermon uh, comes, it, I, I, I'm still learning as a, as a pastor. I'm still learning. And we have a wonderful resource in our, uh, in our resource center that uh, it was written by Paul Washer, and it's a workbook that, um, that goes through. It's called Dis- uh, Discovering the Glorious Gospel. And uh, that one of the lessons in it in particular taught me to uh, put information in one place, stuff that maybe I knew already, but put information in one place that, that really wowed me. And, um, and I want to share some of that with you this morning. Uh, much of my information also comes from my adult Bible fellowship class, the Gospel Project. I had help with the material. In fact, um, they gave me too much help. Like, I had so much material as I was practicing it yesterday after I had it gotten written down. I was like, man, this thing's two hours. <laughs> so buckle up, because, uh, no, I cut a lot of it out, but we're still going to have to move. All right. Um, anyway, I'm going to pray before, before we get started. Um, normally, I would have you all pray out loud, and then I would come and close that time in prayer, because we have so much to cover this morning. I'm going to ask if you want to pray out loud, go ahead and do that while I'm praying. All right. Father, uh, we just uh, lift up our time today. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you that we get to celebrate the fact that Jesus came in a special way at this time of year. Um, Thank you for all that you have done for us, particularly through sending your son, Jesus Christ. I pray that as we open the word this morning, that we would hear, understand, believe, and obey what it has to say say to us. Um, I pray that it would transform lives, that it would uh, cause us to be um, who know Jesus already, to have a deeper faith for those who don't know Jesus, haven't placed their faith and trust in Jesus yet this morning. I pray that they would today uh, as a result of hearing your word. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so Galatians chapter uh, 4, verses 4 and 5, uh, it says this. But when the fullness of time had come, God had sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. I say, well, why are we talking about this particular verse? This is Christmas Day. We should be talking about like Luke 2 or something like that. Well, everything in this verse is significant and very important to who the person of Jesus is. And I hope to show we're going to go through it bit by bit. You know, details are important, and there's a lot of details in this passage. Um, you know, when something's important, details matter. You know, when you go to, uh, when you want to take a flight across the country or the world, um, details matter, right? You've you got to show up on time. Um, you got to show up at the right gate. you be at the right place, the right airport. Uh, you got to have a ticket. Uh, if any of those things don't line up, uh, you miss your flight. Um, and... Of course, when you're running behind, the planes always run on time. When you're running on time, the planes are, all, the planes are always running behind uh, or get canceled, as the case may be. Well, a couple of years ago, in 2021, Pastor Andy, Mike Gray, myself, and one of our missionaries, Josh Doral, uh, went to Kenya, and, and I was the missions pastor at the time and foolishly scheduled it right before Easter, like we were going to be getting back right in time for, for Good Friday. I was like, it'll be fine. Um, and, and it ended up being fine, but it was a big fiasco on the way to the airport. We'd left with plenty of time to, to get to the airport under normal circumstances. Unfortunately, it wasn't normal circumstances. There was, uh, COVID was causing Nairobi to, to shut the airport down like the next day. So if we didn't get out, it would have been, uh, we might've been semi-permanent residents for a little bit, which wouldn't have been the end of the world. I would have enjoyed staying there longer, but, um, I was stressed as the mission, like, I got to get my people out of here. 
And so we're stuck in traffic. And I'll make a longer, long story short, we were stuck in traffic and I'm looking at Google Maps and I'm like, we're not gonna make it. So I asked the church to pray on all things in common and I watched my phone as the, the traffic went from red to yellow to green in a matter of minutes. We finally flew, to, we got to the airport pretty quickly, still cutting it really close. Uh, there's lines, all kinds of lines. Uh, <laughs> so many different security lines and we kept making it through it. Finally, we're, it's like 15 minutes until our flight and we're in another security line. And I'm like, we are not gonna make it. And so I go to uh, um, one of the people that looked like they could help. I didn't even know, I was just guessing. And I was like, hey, um, if we wait in that line over there, we're not gonna make our flight. Is there, a, is there another line, like a VIP line? We're feeling very important right now. Um, and I didn't really say that part, but that was kind of, I felt like that's what I was saying, because I'm asking, but I wanna skip that line. And they actually let us, we, we got, uh, we went through the line. I think all the Kenyans were cursing us in Kiswahili. Um, and I don't blame them, but, because they were late for their flight too, I'm sure. But we got on the flight and at not a moment to spare. Like we were walking up to the gate as they were doing final boarding calls. And, and we made it home. If I, any of the details had been wrong, if, if I had gotten there at the wrong time, if we had gotten there at the wrong time, we wouldn't have made it. If we went to the wrong gate, we wouldn't have made it. If we didn't have our tickets, we wouldn't have got on a flight. Details matter. And here, in this passage, it gives us, in one sentence, some really important details about both the timing and the person of the Son of God and his birth. And so we're going to look at it. And normally when I go through verse by verse, word by word, whatever, there's only two verses here and there's only a few words, I'm actually going to, normally I go starting from beginning and go to end. I'm actually going to start at the end today and we'll work our way back to the beginning. Hopefully you'll see why as we move along. Anyway, the very first phrase we're going to look at is so that we might receive adoption as sons. We're not going to spend a ton of time on this particular point of adoption because uh, you can go back and listen to uh, a number of sermons that Pastor Brian preached in Romans chapter 8. Uh, it covers adoption a lot. Right? We, we get adoptions as sons and daughters of God. What I will say about that in particular is that being adopted by God is a really big deal. And it's, and it's really like you get to be sons and daughters of God. In Romans chapter 8, it uses both the terms you, you get. You get to be adopted as sons, but it also says the, the generic children, both of those are in the masculine, but it applies to both men and women. But I think it's significant that even women get to be adopted as sons, right? Because in the ancient world, you, daughters didn't generally get an inheritance. Uh, if a father was really, really wealthy, they might. But the fact that all of us get rights as sons of God, as though we were first born, that's a really big deal. Um, and so we want that. We want to be sons of God. We, we definitely don't want to not be his sons or daughters of God. I want you to notice a couple of details. First, I want you to know that it says, so that we might receive adoption as sons. Whenever you see the, the word so that, you're, you're looking at results. This is what it results in. Um, so somehow the birth of Jesus connects us to the results that we can be sons and daughters of God. So we want to know more about that, right? Second thing I want you to know is that notice is it says, so that we might receive adoption as sons. Also an important, it says might. Why doesn't it say will? Makes me a little bit nervous that, uh, that the birth of Jesus can help me become a sons and daughter, but it's only a might. Kind of sounds like a maybe. That means if, it, if there's a might, there's also a might not, right? And so why is it that we might not receive adoption as sons? Well, John 1, 10 to 13 gives us a clue to the answer to that question. See, what Jesus was born to do, what he came to do, he died on the cross. He bore the full wrath of God for our sins. And if we believe in him, um, then we get adoption as sons of God. John 1, 10 to 13 says, He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And so here, and there it is, right? 
if you, if you receive Jesus, in other words, it's further defined as if you believe in Jesus, you get the right. In fact, now we can change the word to you will be sons of God. That's what the Bible teaches. The reason why Galatians uh, f- uh, 4 or 5 says might receive adoption as sons is because what Christ did on the cross for our sins and coming to earth, born of a baby, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons is, is effective for anyone who believes, but it is only effective for those who believe. And so believe you must. You might receive adoption as sons, but only if you believe. You will receive adoption as sons if you believe. <clears throat> now, ultimately, what is the result of Jesus' birth? This says, so that we might receive adoption as sons. What is the result of Jesus' birth? Ultimately, it leads to the fact that we are adopted. The result is we are adopted as sons. Next phrase, we're going to take one step back. To redeem those who are under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. Um, redeem is a word that we kind of, it's, it's found a lot in the Bible. I think sometimes we just we read over it and we kind of, from the context, we understand generally what it means. But do we ever really think about what, what redemption means? Um, well, in, in modern vernacular, I think oftentimes we think of redemption in terms of like uh, coupons or, or discounts or rebates or whatever. You can redeem those. Um, Is that related to the concept of redemption in the Bible? I think to a certain extent it is what happened. So when, uh, you know, we were younger, uh, nowadays you show people a phone or whatever or actually tap on it. Amazon has like, you you go there and it has like, do you want the discount, a a $20 coupon applied to your order? Well, yes, yes, I do. And it makes you feel really good that you're getting something for cheaper. They still win, but it makes you feel better. Um, And... Also, uh, but when I, was, when I was younger, and Kelly and I uh, were younger in our marriage, you actually clipped out coupons from a newspaper. And sometimes we would buy multiple n- newspapers, so we'd have multiple coupons. Uh, we go to Walmart. Walmart had this deal where if you, if you showed them ads from a grocery store that had a better price on one of their products, they would match the price for you. I'm pretty sure that whenever we went or to, to Walmart, people saw us coming and they were like, uh, uh, manager, can I have my break now? <laughs> because we would come with a stack of coupons and a stack of, like, we would have all the papers from all the grocery stores from, like, anywhere within an hour. And, um, and we would ultimately, it would take five times as long to just go through the coupons. Um, so that, um, but we saved a lot of money doing that. Now, here's the thing. We never got all of our groceries for free. Uh, we would get like 70 or 80% off, maybe, and, and that was by redeeming coupons. Now, how does that relate? Does it relate at all uh, to the concept of redemption in, in the Bible? A little bit, right? There is something, there is someone who redeems us. What are we redeemed from? We're redeemed from what, what a coupon is. A coupon uh, entitles you to have somebody else pay a portion of a debt that you owe for a product, right? What Jesus does when he dies on the cross for your sins is he pays the entire debt that you owe because of your sin, all right? Not just a port, not just 10%, not just $20 worth. He, he does all of it. When he died on the cross, he paid the entire price of your sin. You get his death in exchange for yours. You get his life because he rose again in exchange for your death. It's a really good deal. Um, You know, redeeming a coupon is a good deal, but getting eternal life in exchange for death is an even better deal, and it's completely free. Why was it necessary to redeem? That's the next question that we have to ask. Like, what, what, okay, good. Redeem those who are under the law. Why do we need to be redeemed in the first place? Uh, it points all the way back to creation. Creation in, in Genesis uh, chapter 2 and 3, we find out that God's standard is perfection. And if you disobey God's rules, you what? You die. All right? So that is the penalty from the beginning was death. 
And ultimately, we need to be redeemed. We need to be brought back because God created us in a special way to glorify him, to reflect his glory in a way that no other part of his creation did. And because we sin, we no longer reflect his glory. And so God needed to redeem, to restore our, our image to be in line with his so that we properly and rightly reflect his glory. It needed to happen, not for us, but for him. It is for his glory that we need to be redeemed. Another reason, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14 tells us, Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil. So another reason why we need to be redeemed is because the reason we die is because of sin. The one who has the power over death currently is Satan. Satan Satan is a dog on a leash, though, because uh, Jesus has already died. He's already defeated death, and he died in our place. The reason why Jesus needed to be born in order to redeem us was be, is so that he could be human like us. He's the only person that ever walked the face of the earth that didn't deserve to die because he never sinned. And so I want you to see something here that it says, to redeem those. When you see the word to, and there's like an action that follows, oftentimes we're talking about purpose. So right here, what is the purpose for which Jesus came, born of a woman, born under the law? It's to redeem. That is the purpose for which he came. Now, how are we redeemed? Hebrews 9, 12 says, He entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. This is a really big deal. Actually, the Old Testament sacrificial system points to the fact that we need Jesus. Let's just take me for example. If I lived in Old Testament times and I owned all the lambs, the spotless lambs, the goats, the, the calves and whatnot, I owned all of them there would not be enough blood to, sh to shed in order to pay and even cover my sins. All right, but the fact of the matter is the nation of Israel had to like share all the lambs. And, and, and so the sacrificial system itself, every time you sinned, you had to cover, you had to offer a sacrifice for your sin. It ultimately pointed to the fact like, I don't have enough lambs to cover my sin. I need a better sacrifice. And Hebrews tells us, the author of Hebrews tells us, there is a better sacrifice, and his name is Jesus. And the way that, that your sin is paid for permanently is through his own shed blood. He's the perfect sacrifice because he didn't sin. I can't die for your sin, and you can't die for mine because we're both sinners. But Jesus can die for my sin because he never sinned. And he offered himself, and he offered his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. He buys us back. How are we redeemed? Hebrews 9 goes on to say, He entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of blood and goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing eternal redemption. Galatians 2.20 goes on, it says, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. So the life I now live in the body, I live because of the faithfulness of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Now, that's from the, the New English translation. If you're reading along in the ESV, uh, that verse there would say, uh, so the life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God. That's a true statement to generally theologically, that is a true statement. But that's not what the Greek says in, in this case. The Greek here says uh, faithful, faith of the Son of God or faithfulness of the Son of God. Um, and, and I think rightly in the context of Galatians, that's what Paul is saying in Galatians. You don't do any part of your salvation, so why are you trying to add works to it? Christ is the one who is faithful, and you live your life through him because of his death, burial, and resurrection, because you have placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. So it is very, very necessary that we be redeemed not only for uh, our eternal presence in, 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 in eternity in Jesus' presence, but also for our life here and now, that we can live through his faithfulness here and now and for all eternity. All right, so what ultimately to redeem those shows purpose, 
What was the purpose for why Jesus, uh, the purpose of Jesus' birth? It's redemption. It's redemption to pay our debt in full. What is the result of Jesus' birth? That we are adopted as his son. So our redemption's purpose is ultimately leads to the result that we get adoption as sons of Jesus Christ. Backing up yet one more statement, born under the law. At the very end of verse 4, we see that born under the law. What does born under the law mean? Why is that significant? Um, Romans 3.23 tells us, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Ultimately, sin is breaking God's law. We fall short of God's glory, which means there's nothing that we can do to to attain it. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death. That's a big deal because... All of us have sinned. In fact, you might try and assume, well, maybe I've done more good than I've done bad, and I'm going to get in anyway. False. James 2.10 tells us that if you keep the whole law and yet offend at one point, it's just like you're guilty of breaking all of it. Even if you only sin one, you just tell one light, white lie, you're a lawbreaker. And lawbreakers deserve death, according to God. I mean, think about it. Adam and Eve, they ate an apple, whatever fruit it was. We don't know. That doesn't seem like a really big deal, but it was a big deal because God told them not to do it. And ultimately, they died for their sin. So it doesn't matter what the sin is. We deserve to die for it. But there's good news. Galatians 3.13 tells us, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. All right, so the very thing that Jesus came to do The reason why he needed to be born under the law is so that he could redeem those under the law. How did he redeem those who were under the law? He he shed his own blood on the cross for our sins. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. Galatians 3, 23 to 26 goes on to say, Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. Why did he need to be born under the law? Because the law enslaved us. It imprisoned us. God's law is perfect. It's just. It's right. It's true. But ultimately enslaved us. Why did it enslave us? Because it pointed out the fact that you cannot keep God's law. You don't have it in you. I don't have it in me. I have broken every commandment of God. Many of them, many, many times. And so the law looks me straight in the face and said, you failed. You cannot have a relationship with God. But Jesus came, born under the law. He kept it, all of it. And so he has the ability to redeem us by his blood so that we can have adoption as sons. Why did Jesus need to be born under the law? So that he could pay the debt that we could not. What is the purpose of Jesus' birth? Redemption, to pay our debt in full. What does it result in? It results in our adoption as sons and daughters of God, if we believe. The next phrase, take one more step back, born of a woman. Think about why that's significant. Why is it significant that, that Jesus was born of a woman? Well, Genesis chapter three, verse 15, immediately after Adam and Eve had sinned, Um, God promised that a savior, a deliverer, would come through the seed of the woman, the seed, a specific person, and names it as he. He would crush Satan's head. And we want Satan's head to be crushed um, because he's definitely a dog and he's definitely on a leash, but his head needed to be crushed. Right away, God wasted no time. It was his purpose in the whole time. His purpose was to send a redeemer, and his name is Jesus. Therefore, Isaiah 7, uh, 14 says this, specifically about the concept of, their, uh, of a woman being involved. This is a prophecy that was written seven, 800 years before Christ was born. Uh, it's a historical fact. We know it was written before he was born. That's what it says. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and, sh- and shall call his name Emmanuel. Um, that's a really important prophecy, right? What does this prophecy tell us? Who, who gives the sign? The Lord himself. 
It's a big deal. Lord himself gave a sign. What is the sign? That a virgin would give birth. Also kind of a big deal. It's never been done before. Hasn't been done since. Um, like a virgin giving birth to a baby. Uh, the problem the problem with this sign is, of course, that Mary and Joseph could have said, I swear, born of, I, I was a virgin, gave birth to the baby, this is the Messiah, and people would be like, mm, mm-hmm, sure. Uh, we know how things work, Mary and Joseph, and that's not the way they work, um, right? So what is it about this sign? How do we know that the sign is actually true? We know that the sign is actually true, that Jesus was actually born of a virgin because everything else that the Bible prophesies about him came true, including the fact that he died on the cross and he rose again. Later, when people looked back at him and saw and remembered all the miracles and things he did, they all made sense. This is God in the flesh. Why? Because he rose from the grave. He is alive. And that means he has the ability, that means the promise was true. This, what, what was said in Isaiah came true literally. If it did not, then the promise is false. And at best, there is no God. At worst, God's a liar and he doesn't actually love us. But it did come true. Jesus was born of a woman. Taking one step back. Actually, no. Micah 2, 5, 2 through 5. Tells us this, again, we're still on born of a woman. Um, but you, O Bethlehem, Ephrathath, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me, one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. Therefore he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor has given birth. And that's the, the piece of it that I, I want you to notice uh, at the very center of these verses. She who has given birth born of a woman. It was prophesied that, that the Son of God would be born of a woman. It's an important detail. He would be human, just like us. Uh, important detail. Then the rest of his brothers shall return to the people of Israel, and he shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of his God, and they shall dwell secure. For now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and he shall be their peace. Um, there's a lot of details in this passage besides born of a woman that actually came true in the person of Jesus, and all of them were necessary to come true. Otherwise, it's a false prophecy. Where, where was this child supposed to be born? In Bethlehem of Ephrathath. It's a, it is a known historical fact. It is a proven historical fact that Jesus, a person named Jesus, was born in Bethlehem. He would be of the clans of Judah. Check. Jesus checks that box. You shall, uh, from uh, one who will be a ruler in Israel. Jesus is the king of kings and lord of lords. Um, he'd be from of old, from of ancient of days. All right? That can only mean one thing. Like, I can't say, none of you can say, I'm from of old. I existed before I was born. No, all of our existences started the day we were born. Right? But Jesus, this child, is going to be said to have been from ancient of days. And, and that is something that he, in fact, claims. He said, before Abraham was, I am. All right? this, this child, this prophesied child, had to be none other than God himself when we add up all the things here that he do. Uh, he's going to lead the flock, shepherd the flock, in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of his name. There's only one shepherd that can shepherd in majesty, and that's God himself. All right. Why did Jesus need to be born of a woman? To fill, fulfill God's promise precisely. So that he could pay the debt that we could not. To pay our debt in full, not just in part. So that we can be adoption, adopted as sons and daughters of God. That is why Jesus needed to, needed to come. Backing up even one step farther, God sent forth his son. We've already talked a bunch about that in, in some of these passages. We're going to talk about one, one in particular. There's a passage that stands out in my mind as in talking about this above all the others. It's probably a familiar passage to you if you've been a Christian for a while. Isaiah 9, 6, and 7. Super important when we're talking about the virgin birth. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, or his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, 
<clears throat> Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Now, this is probably where the most inner turmoil I have in terms of how much I had to cut out of my sermon comes into play. Like, this ver like I probably had an hour of, of material here, and I'm going to have to cut it way back. Ultimately, the point that I want to make, and there's just verses after verse after verse all over the Bible that unpacks wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Jesus is, was, and is all of those things. What the Bible says is true. And each of these names, the thing I want you to, to hear and to see, and we can talk, you want to talk more about this and how each of these things um, it comes into play in the person of Jesus. I'd love to do that with you individually, whatever. But ultimately, it points to the fact that this child that is going to be born can be none other than God himself. Okay, you cannot be a wonderful counselor. You cannot be mighty God. You cannot be everlasting father. And you cannot be the prince of peace unless you are God himself. And if we wanted to, to, to confirm from the text that that's exactly what Isaiah meant, then we just got to keep reading Verse 7 says, of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. Now, what, what does it mean when there is no end to something? That means it's infinite, right? His government will have no end, and there will be no end of peace. Has there ever been a government that has no end or a government that is infinite in peace? No, there has not. We need a better ruler, and his name is Jesus he was born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons of God. Um, when you look at all the details here, he'll sit on the throne of David, establish it, uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. Oh, what, what is the expiration date of his kingdom? It doesn't. It doesn't expire. Now, David was a was called a good king in the Bible, and yet he made a ton of mistakes. Um, there are uh, several other kings of Judah that were, were good kings that we would say are godly, and yet every single one of them failed. And, and, and why ultimately do they fail in large part, not just because of their sin, but because they are dead, right? They can't rule from this point forth and forevermore. That takes somebody who won't die. And because Jesus died on the cross for your sins and rose again and he's alive, like think about that, he's been alive for 2,000 years physically. And he's coming back someday and he's going to reign forevermore. He's the only person that can do that. Um, why did the Son of God need to be all these things? To show us that he's the only one who can uh, why did Jesus need to be born of a woman? To fulfill God's promise precisely so that he could pay the debt that we could not. To pay our debt in full so that we can have adoption as sons. We're going to back up even one more step, one final step. When the fullness of time had come. But I've always read right over that and didn't really think much of it. Uh, Paul Washer helped me to see that's actually a very very significant thing, and here's why. Um, you can, and when you think about fullness of time, you might just assume that that was just like the gestation period. You know, Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit in Mary's womb, and uh, you know, at some point he had to be born, a fullness of time. She gave birth. But that's not what this is talking about. I want to take this. This is going to get a little bit academic for a minute, but you all have proven that you can handle academic in the past, so I assume you'll be able to handle it now. Uh, we're not going to go in super depth, but Daniel 9, verses 24 to 26, tells us what the fullness of time means and how it applies to Jesus, who was born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law. Um, here's what it says. Seventy weeks are decreed about your people and your holy city. I'm going to pause there for a second. Um, you're just going to have to trust me about a few things in here because I barely understand it myself. Um, <clears throat> I'm trusting, I am trusting scholars that I trust John MacArthur being one of them, but there are, are many others. 
who understand that the 70 weeks here, uh, weeks in, in the Hebrew can mean, it means seven periods of time. Uh, it could be, I think, just about any period of time. It could definitely mean days, or it could mean years. And it depends on the context. In this context, nearly all scholars universally agree that we're talking about 70 periods of years. 77 times, 77 of years. So ultimately, when we do the math, 70 weeks of years would be 70 times 7, 490 years. So this passage is saying 70 weeks, 490 years are decreed about your people and your holy city. Listen to this. To finish the transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal both vision and profit, and to anoint a most holy place. That's a lot of really big, we want that, right? Who doesn't want for sin to be done? Who doesn't want for it to be finished? Who doesn't want for it to be atoned for? Like, who doesn't want their sin that deserves death to be paid in full? It says in, in this time period that it's going to happen, right? And who doesn't want everlasting righteousness? I want, I want to be perfect forever. I don't want to sin anymore. And this prophecy tells us that it's going to happen in this time period. Let's keep on reading. You might be asking, okay, well, it's 400. Well, when does, when does the clock start? When, when does the clock start? I'm glad you asked because Daniel answers the question in verse 25. Know therefore and understand that from the going out of the word to restore and build Jerusalem to the coming of an anointed one, a prince, there shall be seven weeks, then 62 weeks. All right, so again, fly-by details here, but they're important. Um, basically what he's saying is from the time that it is announced that, the, the, that Jerusalem shall be rebuilt, that's when the clock starts, all right? We know, it is a historical fact, we know the exact date when that clock started. It's in 444 BC. I don't remember the exact time of months, but it was in the spring. Um, 444 BC, the clock starts because Darius prophesied, or not prophesied, but uh, asked or wanted, uh, decreed that, the, that Jerusalem would be rebuilt, sent help in order to do it. That's when the clock starts. How much time is to pass? Seven weeks plus 62 weeks. Seven plus 62 is 69. 69 times seven is 483. Now, if you go 483 uh, 483 years from 444 4 BC, you get to 38 BC. Um, unfortunately, we know there's nothing really important about the Messiah that happens then. Oh yeah, another important detail. It says that there will be an anointed one. In the Hebrew, anointed means Mashiach, Messiah. And in the Greek, we would translate it Christ. In other words, this is talking about the Christ. In other words, Jesus Christ, the prophesied one, would come and put an end to these sins. When would it happen? 69 weeks of years, 483 years. That leads us to, um, in our current calendar, to 38 BC. The problem was this was written in the Babylonian Empire times. Guess how long the Babylonian Empire's calendar is? It's 360 days. All right? And if you take, and, and scholars have done this, and they have taken, they've started the clock, on the exact date, taking it the 483 years, guess which day that ends up being? It is the day that Jesus rode on a donkey into Jerusalem and proclaimed himself the Messiah. It's a precise promise. If this promise was not fulfilled in the person of Jesus, then we don't have a Messiah. But it was, it's true. It is historically verifiably true that Jesus died on a cross in the spring of 33 AD. And it was prophesied by Daniel exactly when it would happen. Why did Jesus need to be born at a precise time? To demonstrate that there is no other Savior. Why did Jesus, the Son of God, need to do, be all the things that he was in Isaiah chapter 9? To show us that he's the only one who can say, why did Jesus need to be born of a woman? to fulfill God's promise precisely. Why did Jesus need to be born under the law so he could pay the debt that we are not able to pay? And what is the result of all of this? Because of Jesus' birth, 
we can be, we might be adopted as sons and daughters of God if we believe. Now, ultimately, what does... There's something more important even than the fact that we celebrate Jesus' birth, death, burial, and resurrection. His first advent points to what? His second advent. That's right, Nancy. His second advent. And his second advent is an even bigger deal than the first advent. Ultimately, when we go back to our illustration about coupons and being redeemed, what do most coupons and deals have on them? An expiration date. And there is an expiration date on this. It can come in one of two forms. One is you expire. If you die, um, your, your time to redeem the, the coupon of Christ's death is, is gone. All right? You, you have to believe before you die. The second way that it can expire, and it can expire at any moment, is Jesus Christ comes back. His second advent is also an expiration date. If I, either one of those things happens before you've placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, the offer is no longer good, all right? There is an expiration date. Hebrews 9, 26 to 27 says this, and just as it is appointed for man to die once and after that comes judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. The question is, are you eagerly waiting for him or are you scared that he's gonna come back? Right? You are eagerly waiting for him if you've believed in him because you are adopted sons and daughters of God. And that's a really important thing because Revelation 19, 11 to 16 talks about both groups of people. Sons and daughters of God who have been dressed in the white robes of Christ's righteousness and the people who have not. Here's what it says. Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and we know from the context that the one being talked about here is Jesus. It's very, very clear. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems or crowns. And he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That person is Jesus. And you have, to, you have the option today because you're still alive, you're still here, and Jesus hasn't come back you get the opportunity to believe that these promises are true and they apply to you. And if you do, you're gonna be riding behind him and you're gonna be victorious along with Jesus and you're going to enjoy his mercy and grace forever. If you do not believe, you're gonna be tread upon by Jesus and his army. Revelation makes that very clear as well. And so, um, as the uh, worship team comes back and as we turn our attention towards communion, uh, I'd like for you to do uh, something for me. I want you to, to bow your head and, and close your eyes. Um, and in a, in a minute, I'm gonna ask for a response here. And so it's important your heads are bowed, your eyes are closed because if you look at me, I'm going to believe that you're responding to what I'm saying. Um, if today's message, you, you come to the conclusion, oh man, I'm not sure that I have placed my faith and trust in Jesus Christ. I'm not sure which side I'm on, but I want to. I want to know, I want to believe. Um, uh, and, and you want me to pray for you, I'll pray for you generically here in just a moment. I want you to look up at me and make eye contact with me and I will make sure to pray for you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. You can open, open your eyes. Incidentally, not incidentally, not coincidentally, when we celebrate communion, um, it, it, it very much has to do with this. Here's what it says. Uh, for I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, this is 1 Corinthians chapter 11, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this 
as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread, bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until when? Until he comes. So right now, we know when we, do, when we do this together, we partake of the elements, this has no special power to save you or, or make you better, or give you right standing in God. The only thing that can do that is the blood of Jesus that he already shed on your behalf. You just have to believe. So if you haven't believed, there's no real need to take this uh, because you're not really remembering anything. Ultimately, what you're doing is if you drink this, you're drinking judgment on yourself because you have not believed in the name of Son of God. All right. Ultimately, Jesus said the night he was betrayed, he <laughs> broke bread and after he gave thanks, this is my body, which is for you. Uh, do this in remembrance of me. Jesus, we thank you for your, your uh, breaking your body for us. Thank you for coming, born of a bir virgin, born of a woman, born under the law to redeem us so that we can have adoption as sons. Thank you for the significance of your birth, Lord Jesus. Um, just thank you for... Um, being willing to take our punishment in our behalf. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Likewise, in the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Jesus, thank you for your shed blood. Uh, thank you that, that, that we get forgiveness of sins because you shed your perfect, holy but it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you were one of the ones that looked up at me, I'm not going to chase you down. Uh, nobody will. But I would recommend that you would um, talk to somebody about it. I'd love it if that person was me. But if I'm too scary, talk to somebody. Hey, thanks so much for watching online. I hope that this message has inspired you to greater faith, has encouraged you, maybe convicted or challenged you. We're grateful to be able to provide this content to you online, live and on demand. If you haven't done so already, follow us on Instagram, like us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube so that we can get this content right to you as soon as we upload it. But you know, we believe that as a follower of Jesus Christ, that you need the body of Christ. You need the local church. And so if you're in the Quad Cities, let me invite you to personally join us in person for our gatherings on Sundays at 9 a.m. and 1040. If you're not in the Quad Cities, I want to encourage you to go find a local church that teaches the Bible, that serves the community, that loves Jesus, that gives grace. Well, hey, thanks again for watching, and we hope that you were blessed.